أتذكر يوما كنت تعانق دمعة الفكر تنادي الله في صبر وترجو رحمة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله رب العالمين all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Lord of the worlds وأصلي وأسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We send complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household all his companions may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless them all and may he bless every single one of us آمين my dearest brothers and sisters in Islam, as we know, this religion is a complete way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a beautiful gift in the form of His own word, and that is the noble Quran. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this beautiful gift, but it was brought to us through a beloved creature of His, known as Afdalul Khalqi wa Akramul Rusuli. The best of creation, the most noble of all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for us to be the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is actually a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many of us take for granted. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has come to us with something known as the sunnah, his way of life. His speech, his words, his guidance. This is over and above the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It explains what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. It has in it accurate details of what happened a long time back. It has in it rules and regulations pertaining to what may be happening in terms of dispute amongst us. Or rules and regu regulations governing how we should lead our lives. It has in it prophecies what's going to happen, what's going to come close to the end of time. I want to start off today's very important talk with a question. And that is, if you had a vacancy, if you needed to employ someone to do a job for you, who would you employ? Whatever job you had, say for example, you happen to have a teaching post, that is up for grabs. You need to employ someone. You need to bring someone to teach. Who would you employ? Would you pick up someone from the street who's just passing and ask him a few questions and say, come, you can be a teacher here. Or if you were a doctor and you needed someone to assist you, or if you had a hospital and you needed doctors, would you just go out and get someone who specialized perhaps in refrigeration or someone who specialized perhaps in electrics? someone else who might be specialized in a different field, would you do that? Well, the answer is either yes or no. Some people may do that. Some people, perhaps they might think this person knows a lot because they've charmed me with their words. Perhaps a person might have studied a lot through Google. It doesn't make them a doctor. So if you had a medical problem and you were told to go to the best of the doctors, you would be foolish if you just went to someone who speaks well, but he knows nothing. Perhaps he might charm you with a little bit of what he may have seen on Google or perhaps on the internet, but he's not a doctor. You cannot go to him to get advice. Why? Similarly, when it comes to a school, you cannot just take anyone and everyone. And you need to take the person who is best or most suitable for that particular job. For example, if you have an airline and you would like pilots. There are several types of pilots. You cannot fly a commercial plane just because you have a PPL. You cannot fly a commercial plane. You need to have several hours or thousands of miles of experience before you can actually fly a commercial plane. Why? You may have a qualification as well, but because you will put the lives of others at risk or you may even cause such damage that will result in the death of so many people. And this is why when a person becomes a pilot, they first need experience. They first need to sit with a captain. 
they will be a co-pilot and perhaps even lower than that to start with. And after they have thousands of hours of experience, they may then be from among those who've graduated, perhaps they will be tested again and so on. This is something absolutely important. Let's take the example of a medical issue. If you were to seek second opinion from a man who perhaps is an English linguist and he's not a doctor, he might tell you things and charm you, but it will result in perhaps something even worse. He's not a doctor. And if you were to go to someone who's graduated just now and to bring him in and to make him a person who has the final say in everything, what would happen? Those doctors who have 30, 50 years of experience, they would be thrown aside, number one. But worse than that is it would result in the destruction of the entire medical department. Similarly, when it comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every time something had to be done, he selected the best, no matter who that person was. He selected the one who deserved to fill that particular post in such a way that it resulted in the flourishing of that entire department. And this is why the Muslim Ummah progressed. Because there was no selfishness. There was meritocracy. That's what there was. Those who deserved the post, they got it. Those who were the most experienced, they were the ones who actually had the say. And yes, indeed, things were done by mutual consultation. But there was always a leader who had the final say. That final say did not have to be according to the majority, nor did it have to be according to anyone's opinion. In Islam, the final say is with the leader. It can be different from whatever the entire globe has said. For as long as it is within the framework of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, and for as long as it is for the betterment of the entire ummah, it will be considered binding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So if, for example, you were to bring a doctor to look after the lawn in your particular uh, yard, for example, in your garden, mind you, if he may love gardening, he might have a little bit of a flair for it. But we're talking about as a job, you would insult him, number one. Number two is your garden is actually going to flop because he's not a gardener. He's a doctor. Similarly, if you have a dentist, for example, and you want to bring him into the open heart surgery and tell him, right, I know you have a lot of experience with teeth, but since you're a doctor, let's go ahead. Do you know what? The dignity, the honor, the respect, the education that this man has, he will excuse himself for the sake of saving lives. Why? Because he is high in morals, values. He knows this is not what I will be able to do. I cannot do it. And this is why when the Prophet ﷺ spoke about leadership, he always said, don't ever ask for leadership. Don't ask, I want to be the king. I want to be the leader. I want to be the Amir. I want to be the boss. I want to be the Imam. I want to be the Mu'addin. I want to be this. I want to be that. Why? If you are given to it after you asked for it, it's going to be a burden upon you and you're going to be all on your own doing things without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you got it because you deserved it, because you were the one who was the most qualified for it, then you will be helped in order to fulfill the role that has been placed on your shoulders. It's important for us to know this. You might wonder, where is this man heading? Why did I start in this way? And I go back to the first question and I ask it again. If you in your own little business had to employ someone, who would you employ? Wouldn't you employ the best in terms of package? This man knows. When I have this job, he's the best accountant. He's going to make sure that I don't have a problem with the tax department or this is the best electrician or this is the best entrepreneur or this is the most trustworthy. The Prophet ﷺ himself was known as as sadiq al-Amin, the one who is the most truthful, most trustworthy. And he was known as a very intelligent person. They involved him in the solution of their problems or in finding solution to their problems even prior to prophethood. So he was a gem in the community. 
then when Allah chose him or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him prophethood and nubuwa, you find the people fell into various categories. Some of them said he's after power, he's after wealth, he's after money. He did not say, make me a prophet. So much so that when he was appointed as the prophet, he felt it burdensome. It was difficult. Subhanallah. Allah helped him. Allah told him, no, the same applies to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. When he tried to excuse himself, Allah says, no, you go with our help. We will make sure that you achieve. We have selected you. Wallahu faddala ba'dakum ala ba'din fi rizq. Allah says he has favored some of you above others in sustenance. What is the meaning of rizq? Rizq is not just money. Rizq is the favor of Allah, the bounty of Allah, the sustenance. Allah has given you a position, a post. It's temporary. It is a very, very big responsibility. So one day, the Prophet ﷺ was seated, and this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. He was seated with his companions talking. And a man came and asked him a question. When is the hour? What is meant by when is the hour? It means several things. In this hadith, it means when is the end of time? You know, when is the trumpet going to be blown? When is everything going to come to an end? When is the end of time? And so on. But for your information, a sa'a actually means the hour. It also refers to a clock. It also refers to time. When is the time going to come? When is time going to be up? So your time and my time is known as al-qiyamatu al-sughra, which means when I come to an end, it's my own qiyama. That's my time. It was up. I was not... Uh, living long enough to see qiyama as in the big qiyama, but when I die, man mata qamat qiyamatuhu. Whoever dies, that is their qiyama. So when a person, for example, passes away, it's the end of them. When will that hour come? That's another question. And we can also look at it from a different angle. For example, when something is flourishing and it comes to an end, it means that particular item has come to an end. It's the end of that. So for example, you have a big business and I see after some time that it's starting to crash and a day comes when you declare yourself bankrupt and everything is closed. It means the hour of that item has come. It's the end of it. It's the ajal. The ajal meaning the prescribed time set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he asked this question, the Prophet sallallahu continued to talk his, to his companions. Some of them said, Maybe he did not like the question. You know, when you ask the question too many times, he was asked it in the past. When is the hour? He said, Mal mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min as sail In the past, he said, the one who's asking, knows, the one who is asked knows no more than the one who is asking. That's what he said in the past. So some of the companions said, maybe he didn't like the question. And some said, maybe he didn't hear it at all. Subhanallah. So they were looking for some form of an excuse. But when he finished the little bit of speech that he had delivered to his companions or the talk he was actually engaged in, he says, where is the one who was asking me about the hour? That means he heard the question. And that means it was just a matter of time, he answered. So then he says, he looks at the man and he says, When trust is lost completely, then wait for the hour. It means then the time will come. When there is no trust at all, you can have a man with a beard that actually drags one meter to the ground after him, but he's not trustworthy. You can have an imam of the masjid who leads the salah five times a day, but there's no trust in him. You can have a man, for example, who is top notch. The whole community respects him, but he's not trustworthy. Because one of the signs of the hour, an yukram rajulu makhafa A man will be honored, not because he deserves honor, because we worried about what harm he can cause against us. We worried about the damage that he can inflict upon us, so we greet him. We're not greeting him because we want. He doesn't deserve our greeting. The Prophet says a time will come when people will respect others, not because they deserve respect, because they are worried. If I don't, perhaps he will send someone to harm me or he will inflict some damage on me. And that has happened. We know we can see it. So the Prophet ﷺ says, When trust is lost, a man can lie. He can go to the court under oath and he can tell you I've been beaten up. And he is lying totally, completely, no fear of Allah, not a droplet, no fear of the hereafter, no fear of the judgment day. And he lies and he is proud enough to stand in the public and declare that he's a truthful man. That means wait for the end. It means Qiyamah is near. 
especially when such people are given respect in society because people fear if you don't respect him hey i'm a boss why didn't you greet me i'm the boss here i'm the king do you understand when that happens the prophet ﷺ predicted that you will exist in society he predicted what you will do and he knew from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this message had to come to us May Allah forgive us. May Allah grant us the ability to seek forgiveness before we die. When we die, trust me, when we see the angels of death, we will be frightened, screaming. They will take the soul out of our bodies in the most disastrous way if we don't seek Allah's forgiveness. So let's be warned. Like that was not enough. The Prophet ﷺ looked at the man straight in his face. And he looked, he wanted to say something else. Do you know what he said? The Prophet says, When authority or position is given to someone who is not fit for it or who does not deserve it, then wait for the end. Subhanallah. Today you have a man who knows nothing about for example, I'll just give you a simple example about teaching. And he wants to be the big boss. He wants to be a man who wants to control everything and anything without realizing, hang on, hang on, who is the most experienced here? Who has achieved the most here? Who is deserving of this post the most? I give you an example. When it comes to imama in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ makes it clear, clear. You cannot debate with this because it's a statement that is found in most of the books of hadith. The Prophet says, Ya Ummul Qawma Aqra'uhum Likitabillah. You want to be an Imam in the masjid? I want to tell you that the person who will be the Imam will be the one who has the most knowledge of the Quran. The most knowledge, that is the meaning of Aqra'uhum, the one who has read all aspects of the Quran. He can recite it perfectly well. He understands it perfectly well. He is the one who knows all about it. He's put it into practice as best as he can. He will be the Imam in the masjid. That's what the Prophet ﷺ says. Then he says, فَإِن كَانُوا فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ سَوَاء فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ If they are similar in the recitation, the reading, the understanding of the Qur'an, then the one who knows the most of the sunnah of Muhammad ﷺ, he will be the imam. Today, a man knows nothing about reciting the Qur'an. He wants to be the imam. He wants to impose himself. A person who is addicted to pornography and he wants to be the imam in the masjid, insulting the rest of the people. A man who's hooked on adultery, he cannot even... May Allah forgive us. He cannot get his eyes off the women and he wants to be an imam in the masjid. And he wants to proudly say, I am the imam. The Prophet says, when that happens, wait for qiyamah. It's the end of time. It's over. It's over. You won't see any goodness anymore. The time is up. It's gone. May Allah forgive us. A man who lies through the skin of his teeth and he wants to be the imam. He's not fit to be even leading his own children in anything. And he wants to lead the entire community. May Allah forgive us. A man going back to the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, when authority and position is given to a person who doesn't deserve it, then wait for the end of that item. Imagine you have an accountancy department of your business and do you know what? You hire a gardener and you say, right, just keep the record here. What will happen? It's the end of your business. Your business is going to drop. There's no accountability. You've kept a man there who's going to result in the destruction of your business. Imagine you have, you know, you want to fly a plane and you tell a guy who's charmed you with all his words. He's been on a simulator two or three times with a certificate from Dubai Mall saying, you know what, I've been on a simulator. You want to put him on the plane. What will happen? You will die. The plane will crash. He might take it off when he's in the air. He's going to look at you and say, now I don't know what to do. That's what's going to happen. But we do that. What's more important than this, my brothers and sisters, is Islam. Take a look at the madaris, the schools. Take a look at the masajid. You know what we do sometimes? A man graduates fresh. And we think, subhanallah, this man is the king. That's it. He has not one minute of experience, neither in admin nor in teaching. And we want to make him the big boss of the whole world. He must do what he wants, come when he wants, go when he wants. He must not be told anything by anyone. Wait for that madrasa, that school, that masjid, that business, that entire thing to come to an end, to block, to stop, to finish, to be destroyed, and wait for the hour. Why? Because you are thick. That's the reason. You don't have a brain. That's the reason. We have 
people with 50, 60 years of experience who have achieved the world and more. And we want to sideline them completely claiming they are liars, they are cheaters, they are deceivers. On what grounds? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. People who have done good to us, we sideline them totally. And we want to be the bosses when we have not even taught a fly. May Allah forgive us. When we have not had one minute of experience, we graduate today. I told you when a pilot graduates, he cannot fly. He needs to sit with an expert pilot for 5,000 hours before he can get to even, dry, even, even coming on to a commercial flight. Because there are lives that are at stake. The same applies with the deen. The deen is at stake. So I want to end by telling you, my brothers and sisters, the message is loud and clear. Loud. Those who want to fear Allah, fear Allah. Those who want to repent, repent without conditions. Those who want to understand what the Prophet ﷺ has said, understand it. If not, إِذَا وُسِّدَ الْأَمْرُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ أَهْلِهِ فَانْتَظِرِ السَّاعَةِ When something has been given to someone who is not fit for it, Wait for the end, wait for the hour, wait for things to be over and finished, wait for society to crumble, for community to be destroyed, the whole world. Look at what's happening in the Muslim ummah today. People are killing each other, killing. May Allah forgive us. It needs to stop. How it will stop? We need to put authority where it belongs. We need to understand leadership. And we need to understand it from a macro level to begin with. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I end with this verse. إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Allah will never, 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 ever change the negative plight of the nation or a community unless and until they individually decide to rectify themselves. May Allah forgive me to begin with. May Allah forgive all of you. Second, second, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala forgive the ummah at large. And may we have a new leaf, a new beginning, hands down. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.